Um, I would like to welcome everybody to this webinar about indoor air quality, how to ensure healthy buildings during and after COVID-19. Our webinar is scheduled to take no more than one hour. My name is Dieter Schallenberg. I'm the commercial director for Energis, and I will be the host of today's webinar. During our webinar, we will have three expert speakers sharing information and knowledge about this hot topic. In case you have any questions for our three experts, you will find the chat box on the bottom right of your screen in the control panel of this webinar session. In this chat box, you can write and submit your questions, which will be handled by our experts at the end of this webinar. All questions that cannot be answered immediately at the end of this webinar will be answered via email shortly after. Our first expert is Samuel Cayou. Samuel is the head of laboratory heating and ventilation from the Belgian Building Research Institute. For the French-speaking guests in our webinar, that is uh, Le Centre Scientifique et Technique de la Construction. And for all Dutch-speaking people, that is at Wetenschappelijk en Technisch Centrum voor het Bouwbedrijf. Our second expert is Frederik Wouters. Frederik is a telecom engineer and product innovation manager, manager at Energis, an ICT company providing an open, flexible cloud platform for energy monitoring called Energis Cloud. This platform can be further customized by partners such as Metis to build digital solutions, addressing, for example, needs encountered in buildings, as we will see in today's webinar. This brings us to our third expert, Geert Bellens. And Geert is an engineer specialized in indoor air quality in buildings. He's a co-owner of METIS, a company which optimizes buildings for thermal comfort, air quality, and energy. On the agenda for today's webinar, we have two main topics. First are the latest recommendations from WHO, REVA, WTCB, concerning airborne transmission and ventilation. Secondly, we will tackle solutions to facilitate management of indoor air quality and ventilation. These two topics will be followed by a Q&A, during which our experts will answer the questions that you have submitted to the chat box, which again, you can find on the bottom right of your screen at the bottom of the webinar control panels. I will now invite Samuel Cayou, our first expert, to take the word. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction. So my name is Samuel Kiel from the Belgium Building Research Institute. We are a research center, a collective research center for contractors in the building sector in Belgium. And of course, uh, there are a lot of questions related to the COVID virus and building, and especially ventilation, ventilation system. And some of these questions can at least be um, easily answered. And we will start now uh, with the first, uh, the first uh, element, the first thing, the transmission routes of this virus, uh, or this virus can be uh, transmitted from one uh, sick building uh, person to uh, another person. There are um, uh, first two main uh, transmission routes, which are uh, officially confirmed, uh, especially by the World Health Organization. The first one is uh, via uh, large droplets related to cough, sneeze, but also conversation on relatively uh, short distances. And of course, as you know, there are also possible transmission uh, with the hand uh, by contact to contaminated surfaces and, and then contact to your face, your, your nose, your mouth, and so on. Uh, but as, you, as we can see on the, the next slide, um, there are also a third uh, possible uh, transmission route, uh, which is uh, today not officially confirmed by, by the World Health Organization. But uh, in the beginning of the crisis, some other organizations, for example, REVA, 
Reva is the European uh, Organization for AT Ventilation and Cooling uh, Sector. Uh, and a few weeks ago, weeks ago at the beginning of the crisis, they published a guideline about the handling of ventilation system in building related to the virus. And uh, they speak about this possible uh, third uh, transmission route. As we can see on the next slide, on the picture on the next slide, um, yeah, this one, uh, we have on this picture in, in that, that uh, blue, the two main officially confirmed uh, transmission routes, so we have droplets and uh, with the hand. But uh, the, the, the possibility of, of uh, the third transmission route uh, via uh, droplets nuclei after evaporation of the liquid phase, which is uh, which occur after a few seconds, uh, in fact. And this droplets nuclei could be possibly uh, stay in the air for longer time and longer uh, longer distance. Uh, but this is not uh, not officially uh, confirmed uh, today. But anyway, in any case, uh, as we can see on, on the next slide, uh, ventilation is always positive uh, to control the, the, the virus or to, to help to control the virus because ventilation, the aim of ventilation is to uh, decrease the pollutant concentration in a room or in a building by removing polluted air by pressure. So ventilation is always uh, good to um, uh, eliminate or to decrease the pollutant con concentration and also to decrease the, the droplet concentration or droplet nucleic concentration in the room. Um, in this case, so we, we speak about ventilation using uh, outdoor air, uh, fresh air from outdoor air. In case of uh, mechanical ventilation system, it can be recommended to increase the flow rate of the mechanical ventilation system uh, in order to increase the removing of, of pollutants. In some cases, it could be also recommended to use intensive um, ventilation thanks to windows opening, for example. Uh, this is called uh, airing. And we can use uh, airing uh, in addition to mechanical ventilation, for example, but we can for sure also use airing in building where no mechanical ventilation is present, for example, uh, old uh, office or schools uh, building airing is there. The only solution to uh, bring fresh air in, inside and to exhaust uh, polluted air. So the main uh, element to, to, to keep is that ventilation is, is very, very good uh, to, to help to eliminate pollutants and in this case also a virus uh, droplets or virus uh, particles. Uh, but based on the current uh, knowledge uh, on the next slide, um, it is also important to, to add some uh, other recommendation. Uh, next uh, slide, uh, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, based on the current uh, knowledge of the virus uh, and based also on the precautionary principle, we, we have also to pay attention to additional recommendation about uh, the handling of, of ventilation system in building and especially uh, for uh, conditioning, air conditioning assist, some air conditioning, air conditioning uh, system. The first recommendation is to uh, avoid to um, to change the maintenance and cleaning uh, planning. Uh, of course, we have to uh, carry out maintenance and cleaning, cleaning of ventilation system, but it's, it is not necessary in the current situation to uh, carry out extra uh, cleaning or disinfection of, of ventilation system. It is not necessary with a normal ventilation system because the supply air is coming from outside and is considered not polluted and uh, uh, extracted air is exhausted uh, to outside and there are no uh, possibilities to, to for con contamination. Maybe the main uh, important uh, recommendation uh, for some uh, conditioning, uh, air conditioning system is to avoid to have uh, recirculation in the system. Sometimes 
in some of the system, we can have a part of the air which is recirculated in the system uh, for the heating or for the, the cooling. And one of the recommendations uh, from the REVA organization is to uh, stop this recirculation during the, the, the crisis uh, with, the, with the virus presence in, in, the, in our country. In this case, we have to keep, uh, in fact, the ventilation, the basis ventilation with other air and only to stop the recirculation. And the last uh, recommendation is about um, the heat uh, weights. Uh, heat weights, as, as you can see on the picture on the right, is a type of uh, heat exchanger, which is able to recover heat, but also to recover humidity and to save, uh, in some case, uh, energy uh, related to humidification of our building. But with this uh, hot wheels, uh, it is sometimes possible in some condition to have a small uh, leakage or a small recirculation flow rate from the exhaust air to the supplied air. And so uh, it is important also to control this system and to, uh, if necessary, to adjust correctly the pressure difference between these two, these two flow rates. So that was the main um, the main recommendation to be complete about, about this uh, this topic. But the main one is that uh, ventilation is 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 good to help to uh, decrease the pollutants in the air of a room in a building. And of course, to be sure that ventilation is correct, we have to sometimes monitor uh, the indoor air quality. For example, using CO CO2 sensor, uh, this is a good way to uh, check and to control the uh, quality of the ventilation and the level of, uh, of uh, air change, uh, uh, um, air change in, the, in the room, as you, you will see in the next uh, presentation. It's finished for my part. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Samuel. So my name is uh, Frederick uh, Waters. So I'm from the um, energies company. So Samuel has explained uh, well in the in the first part of the, the presentation the importance to uh, renew the air and, and to have a, a good uh, ventilation. So what we will do in the second part of the, the presentation, so uh, here from Metis and myself, uh, will show you how digital solutions can help addressing these uh, these challenges we are encountering today uh, in buildings. Um, so first of all, who are we? So Energis is, uh, is an uh, ICT company, an inter international ICT company. So we are specialized in digital solutions. So our offering consists of uh, energies.cloud, which is a platform, and uh, RASPC, which is a, a data logger. Um, so these uh, digital solutions are um, used to um, uh, by certified uh, partners, so uh, like uh, Metis is uh, one of them, to uh, be used to, uh, in this case, improve the, the situation in, uh, in buildings. So our partners today are in uh, uh, Europe, USA, and, uh, and Africa. And so we believe that by combining uh, technology together with expertise of our partners, so the two together, we are able to address uh, challenges, like in this case with COVID-19. And uh, so by giving tools to facility managers to be able to make the the building environment uh, more uh, more healthy. So, if you go to the, the next slide, please. So, you might ask yourself, how can uh, yeah digital solutions how can they play a role in this uh, in this context? Well, in fact, it's all about taking the right actions, and to be able to take the right actions, you need to have the the right information, and so uh, they can give insight to facility managers into aspects like uh, comfort, air quality, the performance um, or the status of, of equipments uh, like uh, ventilation systems, 
So that's what the digital solutions can, can bring. And how do they look like uh, typically? So they were composed of, uh, of three layers. So the, the first layer on the top are sensors, which are providing, uh, making measurements. So providing data, which can be uh, transferred uh, over networks. So these networks can be IoT networks, but can also be more uh, legacy type of uh, networks, so more uh, older type of networks. So this is then going to the second layer where this data is being transformed into useful information. So useful information can be uh, KPIs, for instance, which uh, allow the facility manager to follow the, the comfort in, uh, in buildings. And then the third layer is the uh, visualization where uh, the facility manager, building manager can, by means of uh, dashboards, or by means of reports follow what's uh, happening in the building. Now at Energies we provide a platform which allows to build such digital solutions and so we believe it's important they have uh, four, uh, four characteristics. First they must be uh, flexible so it's important for the expert to be able uh, to build in the right KPIs, the right alerting rules, the thresholds so uh, into the, the platform. So the platform should uh, adapt to the experts and not the other way around. The, um, so uh, the platform should adapt to the changing regulation, to the, the context, uh, the context we are facing today with COVID-19, for instance. So that's a, a first characteristic. A second uh, characteristic, it must be open. So it's important to uh, collect the right data to have the right uh, measurements uh, to then be able to um, transform that into useful information. It must be fast, fast not only in setting up the sensors, connecting them and being operational, but fast in transforming this data into this useful information to allow the building manager to take quickly the right decisions. And fourth, the fourth aspect, it must be reliable because if data is missing or if data is, uh, is wrong, then the facility manager will uh, take, uh, take wrong decisions. So these four aspects are really uh, very important. So if we go to the, the next slide. So the, uh, at Energy, so we have built our Energy's cloud platform based on the four pillars, I would say. So the first one is to, um, well, it's a cloud solution. So we bring all the data, we centralize all the data into uh, one place. And uh, it has the other advantage to allow uh, to be accessed from everywhere at any time. So the data is stored in the, in the cloud. A second pillar, or what we call connectors, because of the variety of data which might be needed, uh, the ver variety of data sources. Uh, through connectors, we can capture all this data coming from IoT sensors, but also from older uh, legacy systems like uh, building management systems, which can be present in, uh, in, uh, in buildings. Third pillar is big data. So big data means uh, volume, variety, and velocity. So velocity, we need, uh, like I said, to have the data uh, quickly being collected. Variety, it must be open to any type of, uh, of data to be able to do the, uh, the analysis. And then volume. Volume is very important because the facility manager might need to have data for a longer period to be able to, uh, to take the, the right uh, decisions. And then the fourth pillar is artificial intelligence. Once we have the data, we can start uh, modeling it. So modeling the behavior of the equipment. So equipments like uh, Samuel presented uh, or of the building uh, as a well. whole. So that's uh, what's possible with the, the platform. And so if we go to the, the next slide. So now, okay, we are providing a solution for a facility manager, building manager. So what's, what's in it for, uh, for a facility manager? So 
um, with this digital solution in which we have uh, built in the expertise of the uh, expert, for instance, like METIS in, in this case, the facility manager will be able to analyze, detect, and react much faster to anomalies. So one responsibility of a facility manager is to ensure the comfort and the air quality in the building. And so what we offer are uh, two capabilities, visualization and alerts. So through the visualization, what you see on the slide is a, a, a chart, so it's a heat map. And so you see on the top the, the red periods in time and possibly zones in buildings. And so it's very uh, convenient for the facility manager to see uh, when and where uh, a comfort or air quality uh, problem uh, occurred. And so the second capability or alert, what you also see on the screen, so when the CO2 concentration combined with occupancy, for instance, is getting too high, then an alert can be uh, triggered to uh, inform the, the facility manager about uh, this issue. Another um, responsibility is to prevent equipment failures, so uh, or to make sure equipment or uh, performance. And um, this can be done also through alerts uh, by uh, being alerted when there is a technical fault, for instance, of uh, uh, air handling units, but also through a visualization where the key parameters of the equipment can be, uh, can be followed. And so these alerts and visualization allow to decrease the reaction time of the facility manager and to be uh, avoiding uh, complaints from the occupants uh, because he knows what's happening in his building and can react uh, uh, be more much more uh, pro proactive so if we go to the the next slide so i spoke about alerts and visualization in some cases remote uh, control is uh, is also possible can also um help uh, for sure in buildings where there is no building management system or no uh, HVAC control system. So then it's possible remotely to send um, commands, for instance, to switch on or off an equipment or to, uh, to set uh, the temperature at a certain uh, uh, level. And so this can bring another uh, level of advantages like not having to go on site, limiting the uh, uh, intervention costs, or it can uh, help decreasing the energy uh, by switching off uh, devices when when uh, not needed to when it's not needed to to run. So now I will leave the floor to Hirt. Hirt will show um, how this solution uh, that we have built together can uh, help uh, clients of Metis making the, 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 their buildings uh, more, uh, more healthy and uh, more comfortable. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Geert Bels. I'm co-owner of METIS, a company specialized in monitoring air quality in buildings and optimizing buildings. I'm going to tell you a bit about how we monitor indoor air quality in practice in buildings uh, in combination with the Energis software platform and how this can be a useful tool in COVID-19 days like now. So when monitoring air quality, we use basically two systems. Um, at the left, uh, you use a modem or a gateway and then the sensors need to, uh, to report to this modem. And this data goes out to the cloud or server. This is a picture at the left. Um, data is transferred using the internal network from the client, which is not that easy due to security reasons. Or a better solution is that you use a modem with a SIM card. This is how we were doing it the last 10 years and how we still do it for some projects. Then the second possible system to the right is using a low power wide area network or LP1 like uh, Sigfox, LoRa, Narrowband IoT. Those um, IoT sensors or Internet of Things sensors don't use a modem. 
on this on less in specific indoor projects. Um, the sensors report to an outdoor network directly and are typically battery operated and can last for a very long time. What do we measure when we speak about indoor air quality? Of course, we have to measure temperature. We have to measure humidity and CO2 concentration. Um, CO2 concentration is the number for your ventilation performance. In other words, this concentration shows you if you're refreshing indoor air with fresh outdoor air. And that is what we need in COVID-19 days. Those three parameters, temperature, humidity, CO2, they're easy to measure, that's no problem. You'll find a lot of vendors, but watch out with CO2 sensors and their calibration. You need a regular calibration for your CO2 sensor or a replacement of the sensor. Or you need a self-calibrating sensor using a reference measuring room in the sensor or a reference uh, concentration like outdoor air. More specific air quality parameters uh, are volatile organic components. Those are little sources of con air contamination, contamination which are volatile at room, room temperature. There are hundreds of them floating in the air. Fine dust you can measure. It's produced by cars, produced by printers, wood burners. You can measure NOx, you can measure ozone, formaldehyde. Those things are important to the global indoor air quality feeling, but are very difficult to measure correctly. Watch out for cheap sensors who claim they can measure these things. Most of the time they have a low accuracy, a high dependency on temperature and humidity, so they measure wrong. And they also need calibration. So if you measure CO2, you can prove there's a decent ventilation rate and then the, those other pollutions will be diluted also. So we will focus on CO2. Here you see, next slide, slide please. Yeah, thank you. Here you see some examples of sensors we use in combination with a modem. At the left top, you see a wireless battery operated temperature, humidity, CO2, movement and lux combination in just one sensor housing. This is very interesting when investigating indoor air quality problems. Smaller sensors can be used to measure temperature or humidity from climatization as seen in the picture next to, next to it. And for example, contact temperatures of the glass, the picture in the middle, to measure overheating problems. At the right, you see an example of a third party gas sensor in combination with a wireless module for measuring in a room, VOCs, or the picture beneath at the right, measuring VOCs, volatile organic components in the air handling unit. This is a very specific sensor measuring volatile organic components, which can create air quality complaints as already explained. And we couple it directly to our wireless uh, system. By the way, at the top left, uh, sorry, the top right, you see a chart where we see the effect of people washing their hands now in buildings with alcohol gel. This is also picked up by this sensitive, sensitive sensor. So what are the advantages of using a modem in combination with sensors? You have a higher sample frequency. You can we can measure uh, every second if we want. You can use third party sensors using specific input modules like the, the specific VOC sensor. Your network is guaranteed in the building using a modem. Your sensor can be also a logger, which is very interesting. It's safer, you have less loss of data and you can do a remote configuration from on uh, the office. Disadvantages, price is sometimes higher, modem, a modem, an extra modem means an extra cost, an extra connection cost. And if you need, uh, you have, if you have a large building, you need sometimes uh, range extenders. The next slide, please. So more and more we move in the direction of LP1 network sensors. So that's low power wide area network sensors. At the picture you see at the left, a gas sensor next to a gas meter. And in the middle, you see in the yellow circles, temperature and humidity center, uh, sensors in a church. At the right, a CO2 sensor. And at the bottom right, generic input sensors. 
The advantage of those LP1 sensors are that they are easy to configure, easy to install, and most of the time they're very cheap in price. Where there were first only common sensors like temperature, humidity, we are see also now CO2 sensors and even generic sensors uh, like the picture at the right with input modules like Modbus uh, and other types. However, the disadvantage of this kind of sensors is they're limited to 10 or 15 minutes data. You have unsynchronized data, so there's no backup, you have no logger function, and there's a risk of losing data. You're not always certain about the network in your building, in your specific building, certainly not when you're working deep indoor, like in technical rooms or underground. For all those things, however, there are technical solutions. The next slide, please. So now that we know that we can measure indoor air quality with different systems, how can we use that data we measure to protect ourselves from the COVID-19 virus in buildings? As said before, we need to check the performance of our ventilation and to see if the refresh rate of the air is high enough. Measuring data is not that difficult. You can place a CO2 sensor at the wall and look at the real-time data, like the picture on the left. You can even take decisions based on that data. In this example, the picture at the left, the screen gets orange and or red at a certain value. But, but is the decision that you take, is it taken correctly? And maybe you need some more context. If you want to get information out of your data and want to take good decisions, you need software to put your data in perspective to other data points. First of all, of course, you need to write data connectors to get data from different types of sensors in your software platform. You need to store, to store the data in a database because you want also historical data to compare. And you want to look at charts or visual, visualizations which gives you the information you understand, you or your client. You want the software to do some analysis to understand that data. And you need some analytical tools to make information out of this data. Ex examples are counters, simple calculations. By example, how many times did we come above a threshold this day or this week or this month? Is it only during uh, occupation hours that we have problems or also in the weekends or also in the evenings? Or even more complex calculations like linear regression, which trends, uh, sorry, trends can we see over different measurement periods? or even multi-regression models. What is, by example, the relation between the amount of people in the building and the ventilation performance? This is where we use Energis for. The next slide, please. So how can we use sensor data and an analytical software platform like Energis to get useful information regarding the air quality in our buildings? First of all, there are several legislations in Belgium and Flanders that already ask for a minimum air quality. Quality. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. In Belgium, there is a federal legislation for workers since 2019 on CO2 and humidity. And the EPB legislation since 2006 for new schools and other buildings is also uh, valid. This is something we already do. Most of the time we check compliance with legislation and effectiveness of the ventilation system. For your information, with these legislations, the volume of an, of an office is refreshed every 40 minutes. The volume of a meeting room is refreshed every 12 minutes and the volume of a classroom is refreshed every 50 to 20 minutes. But the real question is, is the ventilation work, uh, system working as it should? And the answer is no. Our experience says most of the time this is not the case. In spite of this legislation, most of the buildings are not ventilated as it should. And this is very important and certainly in COVID-19 days. We see less volumes than designs. We see a bad implementation of ventilation systems. We see a lot of pressure loss in the duct work bad maintenance, blocked filters, and a ventilation efficiency, which is very low. 
This is due to the placement of the grills, heating of the air, creating short circuiting, etc. This is why we need to monitor the performance of indoor air quality and certainly now when air quality could be a risk for spreading a virus. The next slide, please. So during a COVID-19 crisis and in a post-COVID world, how can we protect our building? How can we measure the effectiveness of ventilation and indoor air quality? If a ventilation system is existing in your building, you have to focus on the performance of that ventilation system. So we measure CO2. If there is a problem which occurs multiple times a day or in a week, then there's a structural problem and a technical, technical or organizational solution is needed. At the picture to the right, you see the CO2 profile within the background, the occupation profile and a real-time alarm on the dashboard saying that a value comes above a threshold. But even when there's no ventilation system, the same technology can warn you to open windows. We, we use the Energis alert, alert function. This sends an email to a building manager or even to a specific group of people. And you can see the effect on the CO2 concentration immediately. The CO2 is dropping very fast if you open the window. Of course, this is not a long-term strategy. If you don't have a ventilation system, what are you going to do in winter? What if you uh, have to import a lot of cold air, you get complaints of draft. Normally, we use static occupancy numbers, as is in the chart at the right is visible in gray. But if you want to reduce the amount of people in buildings, the occupancy will be dynamic. And maybe you want to monitor that also. Therefore, we use uh, IoT people counters. Those are sensors like this, which can be put on the same monitoring system and dashboard. This device counts the people entering and leaving a building. So you get a dynamic report of the amount of people in a building or a floor or a room. Then you can alert on the amount of people rather than on the CO2 concentration, or you can combine both. The next slide, please. The same technology can monitor the performance of the ventilation system. Energis can automatically download outdoor air conditions so we have the outdoor air temperature and humidity we place some extra sensor in the air handling unit or directly through a main duct so we, with these sensors we see temperature and humidity entering the air handling unit and temperature and humidity leaving air handling unit we also measure real-time air rate of the ventilation system or we measure statuses like ventilation on off filters are blocked etc this gives us a real-time ID of the performance of the ventilation system and cooling, heating, humidifying, dehumidifying state. Sometimes this, is, this information is available in the building management system, but most of the time this inf information is not accessible. With just a few sensors, we make this data also visible on the same platform. This gives real-time information of the air handling unit, so we have short-term operational information for maintenance and technical information. The last slide, please. So we have real-time information on the indoor air quality of different rooms. We have real-time information on the amount of people in different rooms or floors of the building. And we have real-time information on the effectiveness of the air handling unit. Combined with expertise from our side, this gives you insight in the air quality and the performance of your ventilation system. With this insight, you can lower the risk of a COVID-19 virus being spread among your workers. A last point, but also very interesting. Energis keeps this data for a long period. So this is very interesting for long-term evaluations. What is my air quality doing over a longer period? period? This month, this summer, a year, or even multiple years? How many hours do we come above a certain threshold, temperature, humidity, or CO2? When is my air handling unit? Is it cooling, heating, dehumidifying, humidifying during a year? How many people are entering in a building this week, this month, this year, in which periods do we have the most people? Together with the intelligence of the platform, this can lead to information-based decisions for improvements, investments, measures. 
So this is in short how we monitor indoor air quality in buildings in combination with the Energis platform. I want to end my presentation here and I think we can go to answering some questions. Okay, <clears throat> so thank you, Geert, for closing that uh, for closing our presentation. And I would also like to thank Frederick and Samuel, of course. We will now take a uh, five minutes time, or well, let's say uh, ten minutes time to uh, answer some questions that have uh, come through the chat. I will be reading through uh, some of the questions that we have received, and uh, either Geert, Frederick, or Samuel will be answering. Uh, the questions that are there. Um, just to ensure that uh, if your question has not been answered during this Q&A, again, we will take it up after the webinar uh, by email. So, first question, um, can you use a vacuum cleaner? For example, cleaning carpets. I see that Samuel is still on mute. I have unmuted you, Samuel, but you still need to unmute yourself. You need to confirm. Okay. Thank you. No, it's working. Thank you. Uh, so it, it depends. In general, it is uh, recommended to to open the windows when you use a, a vacuum cleaner because most of vacuum cleaner can release uh, dust in the air. So during this uh, cleaning, it is uh, recommended to, to open the windows or to increase ventilation to eliminate all these particles. Um, and this is the same in the context of, of COVID-19. Okay, thank you, Samuel. I'll proceed to the next question. Is CO2 a good parameter to evaluate if ventilation is sufficient? For example, a value of 900, less than 900 ppm, as mentioned in codex, I think I'm going to answer that, Dieter. Yes, you can. Yes, uh, CO2 is certainly the, the parameter that we use to evaluate ventilation as it's uh, very easy to uh, to measure and it's, uh, it's, it's more easy to measure than all the other uh, pollutants in the air. Um, you can discuss about the value 900 ppm. 900 ppm is some kind of trade-off that is used now in legislation between energy and indoor air quality um, but it's uh, it's not a hard a hard value so it's not that the air is uh, very polluted above 900 ppm and that the air is healthy below 900 ppm it doesn't work like that of course uh, but 900 ppm is in general um, the the threshold that we have to be below in uh, in new offices and schools etc but if it's possible to get lower uh, direction 700 600 then the complaints are also less and uh, the the refresh rate is of course much higher which is in case of diluting a virus much much better okay thank you here for uh, elaborating on that other oh, question is it okay to combine opening windows with a ventilation system or are there negative consequences about that? In general, there are no problem to, to combine both. Uh, you will increase the air change rate by opening uh, the windows. Uh, a remark is maybe during the winter, you will also increase the energy consumption because outdoor air is, is colder. But uh, during this season, uh, in principle, there are no, no no problem to combine airing and ventilation system. Okay, thank you, Samuel. Here, you would like to add something on that? Yeah, maybe just a little remark. 
I think in specific conditions in summer, when the air is very uh, humid, uh, hot and humid, then in some kind of buildings working with uh, uh, cooled ceilings and uh, concrete core uh, activation, then you have a really cold ceiling. And if you're uh, there, the air is dehumidified, the air coming from the mechanical ventilation. And if you're going to open at that moment a window with hot, humid air, there is a possibility of uh, getting condensation on the on the ceiling, but that's just a very short amount of time in the year that that's possible. The rest of the time, and as Samuel said, in the winter, uh, just be careful in the winter. But uh, conditions like now, it's it's ideal to open extra windows to to get even more ventilation rates above your mechanical uh, ventilation. Yes. Okay. Thank you for elaborating. I have a question for Frederic. Um, in case I already have sensors installed in my buildings, which are already connected to a building management system, being a BMS, uh, is Energy able to retrieve that data from such a BMS system in order to avoid having to buy and install new sensors? Yes, indeed, that's, uh, that's a good question and because uh, with, for buildings with uh, a building management system in general, there are already uh, sensors. So what, what we can do is um, from the building management system, like uh, systems from Honeywell, Siemens, Johnson Control, so we can uh, export this data to energies. So then we can reuse the, the measurements from these uh, sensors. In case this is not possible, what we uh, then... Uh, recommend is to use our RASPC data logger and to put uh, this data logger on site and so to uh, to plug directly onto the, the sensors of the, the building management system and so to be able to capture the data in, uh, in this way. And um, what we also see often is okay that the sensors are not uh, always accurate enough to, to do what uh, what uh, here it is explained. So in that case, they can be complemented with IoT sensors, so they can uh, live together. So sensors collected via the building management system and IoT uh, sensors, uh, which have been put uh, extra in the buildings. Okay, thank you. We'll proceed with uh, at least one more question before concluding our webinar. Uh, so let me check here. Uh, this one is specifically for Geert. Uh, the question is, uh, what kind of devices are required to measure the parameters such as surface temperature, etc., for CFD model validation? A little bit out of topic, I think. CFD model validation, CFD is a uh, fluid dynamics. You can uh, you make a model on a computer to see how the, the, the air is flowing into a, into a specific room, very in detail. Uh, but I don't, I don't think it's really a topic for the discussion now, but uh, maybe I can answer the, the person who asked this question afterwards uh, in detail, because it's, uh, yeah, it's a little bit uh, difficult to answer in a short notice. It's not about uh, ventilation, mm -hmm. actually. Um, but maybe I, I saw another question. Um, so before proceeding right, to the yeah. next question, the person that asked this specific question, yeah. feel free to contact us afterwards. You will see contact details at the end of our presentation. If you want to have more information about this specific topic from Geert. So Geert, I leave the word back to you. Yeah, maybe I saw an, uh, another question passing by. Do you re recommend installing a CO2 sensor on only main duct return or all branches? Um, uh, sometimes, in, indeed, they, they install a CO2 sensor on the on the main return duct of the ventilation, but this gives a very average idea of the CO2 concentration in a building. And actually, you have to measure in rooms, specifically in rooms, uh, because otherwise you're going to lose a lot of information um, and you're only going to get an, an average of the CO2 and certainly in uh, times like now, if the building is less occupied than normal, you're going to have the idea that the CO2 is very low, but maybe in specific locations, you're going to have high CO2 uh, values where you're not aware 
of it. So uh, we always place uh, CO2 sensors in different rooms uh, and actually not on the return duct of the ventilation system. Okay, thank you, Geert. I'm looking at Frederick and Samuel. If there is one more question that came in, which you would like to specifically address and you can answer in, let's say, one minute, then please proceed. I see maybe some question about the stability of the virus. Um, so I'm not a virus expert, but I can say some elements. Uh, the first thing is that the virus uh, is not able to develop itself outside uh, the body of the infected persons, in contrast to uh, bacteria, for example, or mold. So the virus is not, uh, not able to, to develop itself in dust, in the air, and so on. So there will only be a question about the stability of the virus in, in time. And this is the question where we don't have today a clear answer about uh, the stability of the virus in the air after evaporation of the, of the droplets, or long, which temperature, which humidity, and so on. There are some publications, but, but there are also some contradictions. So it's today uh, unclear. That's why, by preventionary principle, we, we have to, to avoid uh, recirculation and so on. Thank you, Samuel. Frederick, is there one that you would really like to take up before closing? No, no, I think uh, we have to uh, stop at uh, 1 o'clock, 12.30, uh, sorry. So, uh, no, no. Thank you. We respect the timing for closing. <laughs> so that takes us um, to the next slide, of course. Thank you uh, for all of your, uh, all of the time of all of our attendees. Uh, we are very happy to see that you have come in large numbers. Um, you will find the contact details of everybody involved in this webinar on this slide. Uh, of course, the slides that will be shared with you afterwards as well. So you will find the contact details there as well. Um, please be informed that we are also organizing another webinar next week, Thursday, 4th of June. Uh, which will be about uh, measurement and verification in compliance to IPMVP. So if that is a topic that is of interest to you, you can find more information about this on the LinkedIn page of Energies or contact us on our email account, uh, info at energies.cloud. Shortly after today's webinar, you will receive a follow-up email. This will include some information, but also a very short survey and we would very much appreciate if you can complete that survey, just take a few minutes of your time so we can understand and improve the relevance of today's webinar for future webinars as well. Um, that leaves me to thank uh, all of you again. Also, thank you, Frederick, thank you, Geert, and thank you, Samuel, for your time today and also the preparation, knowledge uh, sharing that you have done. I hope it was very valuable to all participants and uh, this can uh, conclude our webinar nicely as uh, agreed on time, 12.30. Okay, thank you thank all. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.